like all of the music this morning was headed to the Lord coming back. And He is coming back. I didn't think we would make 2023. Uh, I've been saved for a good long time now. And every year, I felt like the Lord would come back that year. And since I heard about the second coming and began to study, I always felt like the Lord was on His way and it wouldn't take long for Him to get here. 2023 is a good year for the Lord to appear. And so uh, we would not only get to meet him face to face, but we would be able to uh, be away from all the trials and tribulations that go on in this life. I don't believe there'll be a cold spell like this. We've had this last week or so in heaven. I think it'll all be just, just right. But what a blessing it would be to be on the other side. And I tell you, we, we just thank the Lord for His promise that keeps us looking. We do have some sick folk, and we do want to remember them in prayer. Probably got some vacationers. I don't know, but may even have people that went to the snow country. I don't know. If they did, uh, what was it Jerry Clower said? They need to be checked for the holler horn. It's to go into cold country. Uh, did I say Philippians chapter 3? Uh, turn there if you would, please. Philippians, the third chapter. <coughs> Excuse me. I talked to four of my uh, brothers and sisters this week, only it didn't get to talk to one. And uh, the first one lives the furthest south. And she said wind chill was only 40 below. That was all. And uh, said the... Uh, of course, the moisture in the air and everything. But since they've had that type of weather in the past, they didn't have anything freeze up. Thank the Lord. And then the one that lives the furthest north, I said, how did it get there? And she said, we only got four inches of snow. But with the wind and the, with the snow fences as well, you know, a snow fence is put up to stop the snow, make it drift here instead of over there. And they put them up as they can across the road from driveways and roads and things. And said, uh, we only had about four foot drifts beyond the snow fences. They uh, had to go get a uh, backhoe and uh, clean, clean out. They, of course, they're older than me, so that's why they couldn't do it themselves. But I uh, know it was that, that bad that they had to get somebody 50 below was what the wind got there. And it got there that in a lot of the Midwest, Northeast. And uh, thank the Lord we don't have to live in that country, that we can uh, be down here where it just gets that away for a few days and then changes. And I do thank the Lord for His watching over us through all of that. We did have a good Christmas. Had a good time with Jonathan and family, with Jan's um, sister and, and brothers. Uh, we got to see them for a few hours. And we did have a great time. Now we're looking forward to a great new year. Seems like I hadn't seen y'all since last year. And uh, so uh, it's always looking forward to a great new year when New Year's comes around. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, let's start, I believe, in verse 13. I'll get my glasses on and make sure, but 
Look down to verse number 13, uh, where the Bible says this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And of course, the message this morning is, uh, well, I've got a list of seven things. I don't know if we'll get to the, all seven things, but uh, things about pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises in your word. And we pray that today, that everywhere your word is being preached, Lord, as it's being taught in Sunday schools around the world, we know that some have already had church and they're in the afternoon or evening time. But we pray that your word would be blessed, that it would find a resting place in the hearts and souls of men and women, boys and girls all around the world, that we might press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. We thank you for what you give us for what you've done for us in the past, and yet what you're going to do for us in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. We find this very familiar passage of Scripture. I know that I have preached four different messages out of these two verses of Scripture, just dividing it up. I know I've preached a minimum of four different messages, and over the years, probably 30 times, I've preached out of this passage of Scripture, maybe more than 30 times. Uh, but it's about pressing toward the mark. It's about not giving up. It's about keeping on, keeping on, no matter what happens. I, I preached a series of messages many years back here, and only a part of those messages once before, and that is that uh, the people of the Old Testament that went on in spite of the things that befell them. And one of the things we, when I talked about Job, I went immediately to the thing that beset Job the most. And it wasn't, it was, but it wasn't the loss of his family, of his finances, of his status within the people, of his health, but there's one passage in the book of Job where Job says, The thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. Job went on in spite of worrying or fearing about things that could happen. There are people in this world who spend more time worrying about what could happen than taking care of what is happening. And, uh, and they, they just worry about things all the time. Somebody said, uh, you know, it's like a rocking chair. It might give you a lot to do, but it sure don't get you anywhere. You can just rock back and forth and everything's the same way. Uh, this may not be a word that's used down here, but when I was a kid, my mother worked at a nursing home and we was always uh, getting off if, from school when we was kids. And if, if mom wasn't, was going to be there, then uh, we'd get off at the nursing home and talk to the people and do all that. And uh, you see the old men and the old women what we called twiddling their thumbs. Now, it may not be anything the young people know here, but they'd put their fingers together and they would rotate their thumbs. And they'd be sitting there, wouldn't be in a rocking chair necessarily, but it gave them something to do. And uh, one of the guys got to where, honestly, I couldn't believe this, but he could twiddle one backwards and the other one forwards. I, I could never could get to where I did that. But I never sat on a chair at a nursing home for a long time either. Uh, but uh, th that's what they had to do. And some of it was over worries and over all the other things. Just gives them something to do, but it gets them nowhere. A lot of people are, are involved in that in this world today, worrying about the things they cannot change. We need to change the things we can change. Put the rest of it in God's hands and let's go on with life. And not just life, but Christian life and serving the Lord in all areas of life. Uh, I've got a picture that you don't see uh, that I've on my outline. I always try to make it where I can hand it out to somebody if I, if I need to. But it's a picture of an uh, older man uh, with a raincoat and with an umbrella pressing into the wind. And it has the appearance of leaves blowing against him. And then it has the appearance of a child 
probably 12 years of age, somewhere around in there, holding on to the back of his coat, and that child is, is floating in the air. And uh, all that I put beside it was keep pressing on. Don't give up because it's not just you involved. And um, the, I put the verse there, uh, not the verse, the, uh, uh, the little story, I didn't put it all, but what I could remember of it, about the day that the wind and the uh, cold and the sun was each talking about a farmer in his field and the wind said, I bet you I can blow that coat off of that farmer. And the, uh, the son said, well, try it. And, of course, the cold said, yeah, I'll try it. And uh, so the wind just blew and blew and blew, and the more he blew, the tighter he held onto the coat. And uh, the cold said, I'll guarantee you I can make him get rid of it, but he couldn't. And uh, the more colder it got, the tighter he held on to it. But the son said, watch this. He just simply shined. And it wasn't long before the old farmer got to sweating and took his coat off. Uh, we need to be continuing to go in life if it's the cold, if it's the wind or whatever. And it probably wasn't cold. It was probably something else that was supposed to have been in that part of the story. But, but it's the sun that will warm you up and keep you going. And by the way, in this life, there's plenty. He makes the summer and the winter. He makes them both in our lives. So we need to keep on going. Again, Philippians 3 Verses 13 and 14 says this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I want to ask this question. What are you aiming at in life? What are you looking for in life? And you know, there's always a lot of things that we look for in life. Before Christmas came, everybody was looking for their favorite gift. Everybody, the kids, was hoping. And uh, they just knew they would wake up on Christmas morning and Santa Claus or one of Santa Claus's helpers or somebody had brought them a Christmas gift. And oh my, they was, they was excited and they was going to get what they wanted. And if they didn't get what they wanted, sometimes they got a little discouraged. But you know, they looked forward to that. I look forward to the new year. It's a time where I make uh, commitments, decisions in my life. One of the things that I do every year is I commit myself to read the Bible completely through. Now, I don't ask everybody to do that. But I think that we ought to read the Bible every day, whether you read it completely through or not. Um, honestly, reading it completely through, I don't get as much out of it. If I'll read it completely through and listen to one of the uh, DVDs that, uh, or, or whatever, whatever you call it, cassettes, whatever you call them things, if I listen to them read it, I get more out of it. But I believe we ought to know all of the Bible. I believe we ought to dedicate ourselves in a new year to lay aside the old things. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12, verse number 1, the Bible talks about the great cloud of witnesses, and then it says, let us lay aside, and of course it talks about two things there, and I won't deal with that, but let us lay aside. There's some things that you don't want to carry into the new year, or if you do, you don't carry them too long. I, I, I like the world's strongest man. I don't see it on TV very often. I don't look it up to see when it's going to be on or anything. But if I happen to find it one of the times that I'm watching a television and I happen to see it, I like watching it. But I watch these guys that put things on their shoulders or carry things or drag things. Uh, there's one that was a refrigerator carry. You know, the last time I carried a refrigerator by myself, I was young. I, 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 I know better than to do it now. Uh, I, there was a time when I would pick it up and bend my back and twist and set it on something a little bit higher and uh, finally get it to where I could rock it back and forth and get a good hold on it and I could carry it. But I sure, I, oh my, I sure have hurt myself doing those kind of things. There, there's some things that are weights 
that we need to leave behind in the old year. And any of those things which keep you from serving God, leave them in the past. You know, I might get up here and preach about uh, alcohol or something like that, drinking liquor. Uh, that's sin. That's not a weight. That's a sin. You're not, you shouldn't be doing that anyway. Just let it go. The Bible talks about no drunkard entering the kingdom of heaven. And so just let that go. Uh, but the, some of the weights in our life, we need to lay them aside and let the Lord work in our hearts and work in our lives. But what are you looking for this year? What are you hoping to end up? You know, uh, if, you, if you were a business type of man preacher, you would give a set of goals to the church. I have, I've never done that. A lot of good preachers do, and I, I'm not against it if, if they're proper goals. And, uh, you know, we need a set of goals, and that is uh, one of them, uh, one of the preachers that I've known for a long, lot of years, he, he, every year he said, uh, has in there to read your Bible through, to have prayer every day, uh, to have three services every week, revivals, Bible conferences, missions conference, all kind of stuff. Uh, every, uh, throughout the year. And uh, then he puts in there to make so many contacts for the church. And he puts his own personal number of contacts that he wants to make for the church. And he puts it pretty high. He puts it at 365 contacts that he makes for the church. Now that's not contacting the same individual. That's contacting different people. And uh, he, he doesn't witness to everyone he doesn't uh, even invite everyone to the Lord's house, but he does make those contacts every year. And he asks the church, each individual, to set how many contacts they'll make. And they put it up on the board, their, their particular board. Let me see if I can see where it would be. Uh, it would be right here behind me just a little ways uh, on this side. And, uh, boy, when all everything goes up and when the Sunday school teachers have turned their slips in, they put the number of contacts that are made. And sometimes the contacts is less than seven. So you know the preacher didn't make seven contacts. Don't know how many of them he made, but that means that most everybody else didn't contact anybody about the Lord or about, about going to church. And all the preacher would, would generally say is, they're not all mine. I didn't make as many contacts. And of course, he, goes, he makes a contact at the hospital. He makes contacts everywhere he goes. So he can make his 365. At least that's my excuse. Uh, you know, the preacher can make it because he's always out and busy and everything else. Uh, but we all can make contact. We ought to, ought to have a goal. We ought to have a purpose ahead of us. What do you want to get accomplished this year in your life? Uh, do you want to have uh, $35,000 set aside in your retirement account? Uh, do you want to you want to have your new car paid off? Uh, and and I think most of our financial advisors today would say, don't buy one uh, or don't buy it on credit. Just put up until you got enough money and uh, start making payments. I used to tell my boys that all the time. They'd say, Dad, help them, help me buy a car. And I said, All right, how much money can you put up every month? Oh, I'm sure I can pay $150. This has been some years back, by the way. I'm sure I can pay $150 on a note. I said, all right, the day that you have $900 in the bank, then we'll go get a car that you pay $150 a month on. Well, how am I going to do that? The same way that you're going to pay it monthly, you're going to take that out every week, whatever it amounts to, and you're going to put it in the bank. And, uh, and boy, I mean, it just took them forever. I've, I've told my, my granddaughter that. And I said, and my grandson, I said, start putting up. You get any money, you give to the church and uh, you give to your mama to help around the house here. And then you put money back. And after you put money back uh, for a future purpose, whether it's clothing or a car or whatever, you put that money back. If you have any left over, ask the Lord what he wants you to do with it. Don't say, let's go to the steakhouse and eat. I'll pay for it. No. Uh, put it up. Learn to save your money. Uh, but they don't want to do that. You've got to look to the future. You've got to be able to do these things. You know why poor people are poor? I'll tell you what my dad said. He wasn't a Christian when he said this. He said, because of credit. He said, you go out and get something you don't have to have because of credit. It looks pretty or it tastes good. 
but you could have ate beans and, and cornbread instead of eating what you ate, and you could have put that money up. Now, I'm not telling everybody to be in the poorhouse, but we need, what's your aim? What's your goals? All right? Well, are you aiming for marriage, husband and wife? Okay? This, this goal right here is the only one that once you receive it, you receive a husband or you receive a wife, that goal is met and finished. You're never to look for another one because you've got the one that you're supposed to have gotten. You prayed and you sought the Lord's will and you married the right person and you treat each other right because you're both Christians and you're living right and doing right. The blessings of God is on your life and you don't ever look for another one. But everything else I've gotten down here, you always look for another one. I think the first one that I got is a trophy deer. Has anybody, is there anybody, and you can put your hand up if you want. I don't, I don't expect you to put your hand up. But is there anybody that doesn't want to get a deer that is bigger and better than the best one you've ever got? Yeah, those that quit hunting. They're the only ones, those that have quit hunting. Um, have you caught the biggest and best fish you've ever wanted to catch? You say, well, I don't know. I got the one that holds the state record. I don't think anybody here does. They may have. I don't know. Uh, I hold the state record. I don't want to know. Yeah, you do. You want to break that record. And you want to go further and better than that, don't you? Uh, those kind of things you keep going. Of course, most of us, I was just glad to graduate high school. That was my biggest goal as a kid. My mother said she'd beat me to death if I didn't graduate high school. So I had to. Didn't know I'd go to a Bible college. But then I, when I got there, I said, I'll be glad when I graduate from here. Uh, didn't, learning was not my forte. And uh, so I, I didn't care for it. And I didn't really want to go any further. Uh, but you should. And I've studied every day of my life other than sick days since I've graduated. Uh, but then uh, you want to hit a home run if you're playing baseball. Maybe you want to make the uh, field goal if you're the kicker or the touchdown if you're whatever the this, uh, position that carries the ball. If you're the quarterback, maybe you want to throw the longest or the most passes and everything else. And that number just keeps going up and up and, and it changes all the time. Some things ought to stay the same. Uh, maybe you want to please your parents for the very first time in your life. That's your goal. I'm going to please my parents. They're not going to look at what I did and say, yeah, that's okay. They're going to look at it and say, oh, you did a good job. You've got to do a good job before they can say that. And hopefully they take into consideration your abilities. But some think they never please their parents. But your parents are proud of you, I promise you. Uh, and then not only hit a home run, please your parents, but the bad one, want to lose weight during the new year. There's a hope that I'll lose a few pounds during the new year. They put me on a diabetic pill that says I might lose two to three pounds. So, uh, so maybe I'll lose two to three pounds in the new year. But uh, we have all these goals in mind. But if you don't press toward them, if you have the goal of losing weight, you know what you've got to pass up at the grocery aisle? You've got to pass up the desserts. You've got to pass up the ice cream area. You got to pass up all them carbohydrates. Hey, the thing that hurts the worst is potatoes. I, I, you know, they t they tell me potatoes isn't a vegetable. I said, yes, it is. They said, no, it's a starch. You know what they call vegetables? Cauliflower, broccoli. What is that little round thing? Almost looks like a cabbage and tastes like dirt. Broccoli? No, not broccoli. Brussels sprouts. I never, my son says, Dad, they're good. I said, son, you're sick. Uh, they call that kind of stuff vegetables instead of potatoes. Oh, and I'll eat beets and a whole lot of other things. I like a lot of stuff, but potatoes are the best. You know what they, they told me? Just eat the skins. I said, you're kidding me. I do eat the skins with a baked potato. I do, but it's with the potato. You've got to press forward, don't you, in every one of these. You want to get a wife or a husband? You've got to get out there where they are. You want to catch a fish? Find a lake. You want to get a deer? 
Get your hunting license. Find, get somebody to help you and learn and teach you and, and get out there and find out where they are and kill one and bring it home and tell dad or somebody that you need it mounted because it's your best. And then next year, it'll be a better one. We need to keep on keeping on. But let me give you a few other things and I'm going to read a few of these verses for sakes of time. But maybe you want to please God. In 1 Thessalonians 4, in verse 1, the last half of that verse says, As you have re received of us how you ought to walk. Okay? Now in Colossians it says that how we ought to, you know, we walk according to how we were saved, and that of course is by faith. But it says that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, pretty much the last part of the verse to walk and to please God. Maybe you've got a goal this year of pleasing God. You say, well, I'll never please my parents completely or my boss or whoever, whoever it is you want to please. Uh, wives, you say, I'll never please my husband. Keep trying. Husbands, I'll never please my wife. Keep trying. If you watch, you'll be able to tell. You know, I don't know why this came to my mind this morning. I didn't write it down, but it came back again. So I'm going to just say this, nothing about the scripture. But husbands, you've got to be able to read your wife. I'm not the best at that, but you've got to be able to read her. This particular thing that I'm talking about is when you come home, now, your wife may be working and get home after you do. But if she's already home and you come in and she turns around and there are tears in her eye, you've got to understand, first of all, of those tears of joy or tears of sorrow. She'll need a hug either way. But figure out whether it's sorrow or joy. She may have just gotten a call that one of her best friends just had a baby and the baby was healthy and everybody's excited and their tears of joy. But she may have gotten a call that a best friend just had a miscarriage. And she's not going to need you to be the old gruff, I'll fix it guy. She's going to need you to be the guy that comes in and puts your arms around her and say, anything you need, anything. I'll be there for you. We have to learn to read them. That's hard. They speak a different language than us men do. But we've got to learn that. They need to learn to read men too. But we have to, if you want a better marriage this year, you don't need a better wife and you don't need a better husband. You just need a better relationship with each other. Uh, maybe she want to please God. Maybe it's hearing these words in Matthew 25, 23, the Bible says, his Lord saith unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I believe that's telling us that there's coming a day when we can hear from God a well done. We call it the WD degree. When we leave this life and come into the presence of the Lord himself and we, he welcomes us home to heaven, I believe that we can hear that well done, thou good and faithful servant. We have to be what it says to receive it. But we can receive it. Maybe it's the touch of God that you want this year. Now everybody thinks about the touch of God in a little different way. I'm not going to go back to the book of Daniel. Some of you will remember I preached on the five times Daniel was touched in the book of Daniel. One time it touched him. He was on his knees and he raised up his head and hands. Another time it says that he, was, he uh, was touched and he was strengthened. Another time it says that he was touched and he understood the dream or the, the, what, was, what was, he was supposed to understand. He had asked for that interpretation of it. And, and, and then there's two other times as well. But you just may want the touch of God. I can tell you that Preachers and Sunday school teachers will know when they're in the pulpit and when God's touching them in the pulpit and when He's not touching them in the pulpit. And I'm going to tell you, it's not a fun thing to be behind the pulpit and you're pulling the plow by yourself. If the Lord's not pulling with you, I can remember one day a good preacher friend of mine, and I really thought he's a great spiritual preacher, and maybe he is. Maybe he was then. But he just preached just a few minutes and he said, Hey, I'm in this thing alone. It's somebody else needs to be up here. And he went and sat down. He said, I'm pulling the plow by myself. 
said, somebody that's got a touch of God on them this morning, come on up. And, uh, and boy, the next guy got up and he had the message. His last name was Nut. And I had picked on him for years. He was a missionary and picked on him for years. I said, brother, you've been a nut ever since I've known you. And, uh, but he got up and began to preach that morning. It wasn't 10 minutes. The altar was full. The ladies, we was having a camp meeting. Ladies that was in the fellowship hall, it was right straight back through that door the way over there uh, in, the, in that particular church. And uh, boy, all of a sudden I heard that door open and one of them peeked in to look around to see why it had gotten so quiet because there was no more noise over the loudspeaker. And it wasn't long before that one and then the other two came in and got them a place at the altar because they just felt like God had moved into the place and he had. The touch of God had come upon them. And there are times when you need the touch of God. Those are Daniel 8 and verse 18. I won't tell you but one time maybe or maybe twice. Daniel 8, 18. Daniel 9, 21. Daniel 9, 21. Daniel 10 and verse 10. Daniel, Daniel 10, verse 16. And Daniel 10 and verse 18 are the ones that I remembered and wrote down about the touch of God. And boy, that day, the touch of God came all over that church. There was one guy, I heard him, I couldn't see him anymore. When we finished, went back to the fellowship hall and it was one at a time going back, sitting in their seat, weeping, rejoicing, just enjoying the presence of God. And I kept hearing this one every now and then, but I didn't see him. And we finally prayed over the food and dismissed, went back. There was no need in preaching anymore. It was time to fellowship. And uh, I kept looking around and after everybody else got out, he rolled out from under the pew. I said, Brother, what you doing under there? You probably remember me saying this before. He said, I didn't feel what everybody else felt. And I didn't want anybody to know that I wasn't right with God. I said, the Lord knows. He said, I'm going to stay here while you all eat. He didn't come in while we ate. But later on that afternoon, he came back and told me that he had gotten things settled. said, the Lord made it clear what his problem was and he got it settled. What a blessing it is to have the touch of God on you. And maybe it's a physical touch. Maybe it's a financial touch you need. Maybe it's a spiritual touch that you need. Maybe it's an emotional touch. But God is able to give you that touch if you need it. And if it's time, sometimes we, we go through hard times, but God is able. Then maybe you just, what you're looking for this year is just believing God for the impossible. I'm going to ask for hands. Has anyone here ever believed God for the impossible? I have. I have when times that doctors have said there's no hope. In times when I've been told don't come to the hospital, the doctor said they're not going to live 10 minutes. And I saw them for months and months after that time. In time when I thought I would never have peace of mind in my heart, it seemed like an eternity. And one day, the peace of God flowed in again. You see, we, we need to believe God for the impossible. Not just what doctors can do and not what a psychiatrist can do, but what God can do. Well, when you're getting ready, there's a preacher. I say he's a friend of mine. I only knew him a very short period of time. He was still in the ministry the last I knew. But he wanted to be in the ministry. He and his wife, I think, had, I think it was eight children. And one day, she was just missing. And they thought, sure, something had happened to her. But when the police got to investigating, she took enough of her personal stuff. She didn't take much, but she took enough. They figured it out. And they found out where she had gone. And she was hiding from her husband, from the church people and everybody else. And she filed for a divorce from her husband. And he knew that that would be the end of his ministry. He said, I want my wife to come back. He said, I'll go to counseling if I need to. He said, let's just don't get the divorce. And he told the judge, he said, can you put it off as long as you can? And the judge, because he was a good Christian man, said, I can't break the law, but the law says it has to be one year. 
And it was a sad ending. I've told this before here as well. But on the day, the last day where they had to go and sign the papers, he was on his way to court. In fact, he made it to the court. And she didn't. He left the court after they told him. Went back to the church where the people were praying. On the way to, to the courthouse, she went through a, a, a street and somebody ran the stop sign on the other side, a drunk, and killed her. It was sad. It was one of those miracles that nobody wants to see. But it saved a man and his family, a ministry in their lives, not being torn up. They were tore up, but not in the same way. It's hard sometimes, but miracles come in a lot of different packages. Believing God for the impossible. Who in the Bible believed God for the impossible? I'll just say Abraham. He's not the only one. It was a time when men and women don't have children. A time of age even back then when they're far beyond all of that. And yet God gave them, even after they sinned and didn't do right, by saying the handmaid can produce a child, God gave them the child that they that he wanted them to have. And uh, boy, isn't it an amazing thing? We can believe the impossible. Let me give you just a few of these things very quickly. Number one, when pressing towards the mark in verse number 13, we've got to realize you haven't arrived and I haven't arrived either. Sometimes preachers think they've arrived. I, I know I haven't. I know my failures and my faults. And uh, I don't tell them all to you because I don't want you to, to know all of them. You know the ones you see. But we haven't arrived. I've, the first church I was full-time pastor, the man who pastored there before me, taught his people that he was the closest thing to God that they would ever know. And so they was to treat him as if he was God. When one of them told me that, I said, you're kidding me, right? He said, no, man, he, he told us that. It was an adult meeting. It wasn't none of the children were there, but all the adults were there. He told them that, Sunday school time. And uh, so I asked one of the others, how did he say that? And they said, told me what he said, and said, I can't believe that. I said, y'all just misunderstood him. He just probably meant to say that uh, you need to treat me right because I belong to God. But that isn't what he said. And I told them, I said, the day you think I'm closer to God than anybody else in this world, and you better treat me like God, you better ask me to leave. Because I, I'm not your God, and I never will be. I know my shortcomings. I know my failures. And I know my faults. At least I recognize most of them. I haven't arrived. There's more growth. There's more knowledge. There's more work to be done. I haven't done everything right, and nobody ever does everything right. Pressing towards a mark means that you believe or you realize that you've not really attained. Uh, Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count myself, not myself, to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, he says, uh, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before the first thing that we've got to do is lay the past down. The past failures. Now, you want to remember them so that you don't do the same thing again. The past victories. You're, you're not living today on two years ago victory. You need victory today. So lay those down. Remember them. And remember what a great God you serve. But don't let the fact that you don't have that same big victory today get you discouraged or get you to quit in any way, shape, or form. We need to lay those things aside. Here he says that he, uh, uh, he one thing he does, he forgets those things which are behind and he reaches forth unto those things which are before. You can't change the past. Now, you can affect what you did in the past that affects others in the present. And that is confession 
asking people to forgive you, you forgiving other people, all kind of things. You can change your testimony. If it was bad in the past, it can be good from now on out. There's a lot of things that you can do. But you can't change what happened. You've got to move on. You can't let the past keep you from living and doing what's right in the present. Secondly, it's a personal thing, pressing towards the mark. Now, my dad wasn't a preacher. I know a lot of young men who grew up in the pastor's home, and their dads were preachers and missionaries. I've had a few of them tell me, you know me, you know my dad. And I would say, your dad has nothing to do with it. Who are you? And I was telling this one boy this. He was a missionary son. He, he said, what do you mean, who am I? I said, forget about your dad. Forget about your mama. Forget about your grandparents. Who are you? He wanted me to help him. And he was banking on the fact that I knew his dad and that his dad was a missionary and good people. I said, who are you? Are you good people? He said, well, yeah, you know I am. My dad raised me right. I said, I don't know that. I gave him a place to stay, bought him some food. Come in on a bicycle. Didn't have anything with him. He left, I guess, with that bicycle loaded up and went to the pawn shop and, stole, and everything he could carry sold at the pawn shop downtown. The police found him and I went in. I said, keep it. You don't need any y'all losing any money. I just know what, to re know what I need to replace now. Who, who was he? I, he was a missionary's son, but it didn't change him. You got good people behind you, but who are you? It's a personal thing. You got faithful parents. You got faithful grandparents, faithful great grandparents. Your line and lineage goes back a long, long ways. But what does that do for you? You're the one that's got to press toward the mark. You don't have to press like the old timers had to press. It was a different world. And, and let me tell you, uh, uh, well, let me move on to the next one. The part of pressing. Uh, the third one is to press toward the mark. It's a physical and spiritual mark. The word press that's used here or the word follow after is the same thing. Forty-seven times in the New Testament the word uh, is uh, translated to press or to follow or follow after or some, fo uh, some form of that. I think it's 47 times in the New Testament that it says that. And I want to read some of these times where it says that in the Scripture because there is sometimes a physical pushing. Most of those times it's talking about making it through persecution. And if we read what the Apostle Paul tells in the first part of chapter 3 of Philippians, he tells you he was a persecutor of the church. So he knows what Christians go through because he was one of them that put them through their paces. And he tells others, you press on, you follow on. Let me give you, uh, well, Philippians 3 and verse number 6 says, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is in the law, he said I was, he was blameless. He was blameless, and yet he persecuted the church. Philippians 3, 12, Not as though I had already attained or either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I might apprehend, for that which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Philippians 3 and verse 12, uh, this, uh, I, I think is, is what that one was. First Thessalonians 5, See that none render evil for evil, but, uh, uh, but every, unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. That is the follow, the same word there. Uh, then it goes on in First Thessalonians 5 and 15, See that none render evil. Let me, I'm reading the same one. Verse, First Timothy 6, 10, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. That's the same word as press on. Flee these things, follow righteousness. And then in 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 2, it says, flee also youthful lust, but follow the same word for press on. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see, we're to follow on. We're to press on. And sometimes it's physical, but many times it's spiritual that we have to press on. While you press on, lay aside those other things that are holding you back. Just let them fall off. Let them drop off. 
You know, it, it's kind of an amazing thing when you see a young Christian. They, they begin to change. They get saved. They come to church. They begin to change. I, I think of one in particular, my brother-in-law, many years ago. I only know the story from the preacher that was there when he got saved. But he invited this, my brother-in-law to church. He was single. He wasn't my brother-in-law at that time. And he said he went, come in, sat on the back row, put his feet up on the up pew in front of him, leaned back and just sat there. Didn't hear a thing. Said the next service, he come in and moved to the other side on the second to the back row. And said the next time he moved up a pew or two and said the night he got saved, he had moved up to the first row. He said, you know, after he got saved, he hadn't missed. He's been on the front row ever since. He said the Lord has dealt with him. He didn't know how to read and write very well. When he got married, his wife, all he had known was what the Bible on record, what he had heard it and what heard other people say. But his wife sat down with him and she had some college and had been a librarian. And she sat down with him and taught him how to read well. He'd been serving the Lord ever since. His life has changed. He used to go around and shoot deer illegal, throw them in the trunk of his car. Said he'd never do that again. He thought he killed one one night, him and his buddy. They threw it in the trunk of the car and all of a sudden they heard the worst noise. Said they got out, that, that deer had done kicked the headlights out of that, I think it was a 63 Chevrolet, done kicked the taillights out. He told his friend, let him out. And his friend said, you let him out. He got saved, he didn't do that anymore. God changed him. You could see his growth. And I've seen his growth over the years. He can quote more Bible than I can. He remembers more Bible than I remember. To see people change, to see him do differently, what a blessing it is to see those things happen. Well, pressing towards the mark is a goal. Have you set your goal? What goal do you have? I've told this before about a preacher friend of mine up in um, not Aurora, Illinois, Oswego, Oswego, Illinois. And his dad was a good preacher friend. And uh, this boy was a jokester. And all of the, during the missions conference, all of those young guys was talking, what you going to be uh, when you get grow up? Are you going to college for anything in particular? And one of them said, I want to be an evangelist. The other one said, I want to be a missionary. And the other said, I want to be a pastor. And they asked the preacher's son, what do you want to be? He said, a Christian drunk. And the other boys looked at him. I heard him say it, and I said, you know there's no such thing. He said, well, that's what I want to be. He was just joking and playing around. There's a lot of Christians who do drink and get drunk, sadly. But at the same time, he was just playing around. But what's your goal? What's your real goal for you in your life? Hey, have you ever seen a Sunday school teacher that you thought was the greatest in the world? Do you want to be a Sunday school teacher like them? Share the Word of God. Study. That's the way you're going to be a Sunday school teacher one day. Pressing towards the mark has its rewards. And I can't give you all of these, but Revelation 22 and verse 12 says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. 22, 12, when Jesus comes, he brings his reward with him. And then, pressing toward the mark is honorable. Remember that. Talking about Christians pressing towards the Christian mark. I, pr I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. It's honorable. Don't dishonor it. And lastly, pressing towards the mark is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need this year to press toward the mark. If you haven't read your Bible today, read it today sometime. If you haven't prayed today, I'm talking about real prayer. I'm not talking about play prayer. But if you, if you haven't prayed, pray today. If you hadn't encouraged someone, encourage somebody today. Everybody needs a little encouragement. Just encourage them a little bit and just go on. Have you met your goal for the day? If you hadn't met it for the day, you won't meet it for the year. Let's bow our heads.